the moment. Now. Okay. We are live. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Matt McAdam. I'm uh, acquisitions editor at Johns Hopkins University Press. Uh, I'm hosting this conversation today with my colleague, Philip Leventhal, at uh, Columbia University Press. Say hello, Philip. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Matt. My name is Bob Lemthal. I'm an editor at Columbia University Press. And Matt and I, along with some other editors, um, are part of the newly formed, or formed a couple of years ago, um, Acquisitions Committee um, for the um, AAUP. That's right. So, uh, so Phil, as he said, we were part of this committee, and we uh, were charged uh, with writing this document, Best Practices for Peer Review, that the AAUP uh, published uh, this summer. And um, that document is the sort of uh, impetus for our discussion today. It's a stepping point. Um, and uh, so real quick, uh, you can um, submit comments uh, or questions on YouTube via that. Can you read that? There we go. That's the hashtag uh, on Twitter or via uh, <laughs> YouTube, I am told, though I haven't looked at that. So uh, I'm joined uh, by some wonderful colleagues from all over the country today, and uh, I will um, Invite them now to introduce themselves. At first, uh, Sarah Bond. Hi, uh, I'm Sarah Bond. I'm an assistant professor of classics at the University of Iowa, and I'm also a part of the digital humanities group here at the University of Iowa. So I work a lot with uh, publications that are traditional through print journals and, and through um, traditional monographs, but I also work a lot with uh, online media and online publications. Great, welcome. Thanks for being here. Okay, so next we have uh, Karen Wolf. Hey, this is great. Um, I, I'm a, a director of the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture, where we publish a journal, The Women Mary Quarterly in Early American History, and also we have a book series that we publish with our uh, press partners at the University of North Carolina Press, and we also publish on an app, the OI Reader. I'm also a professor of history at the College of the Women Mary. Wonderful. Thank you for being here. And next, finally, we have uh, Lauren McLaughlin. Hi, um, I'm uh, editor in chief here at the University of Washington Press. I've, I've been here since 2014. Uh, we acquire in a number of areas. My uh, main focus over my career at two other presses has been working in women's gender, sexuality <laughs> studies, and critical race studies. So that was at University of Illinois Press before this one, and before that, SUNY Press, where I started as an acquisitions editor. Wonderful. Welcome. Thank you very much. Okay, so this is how it's going to work uh, just briefly today. So I will, um, in a moment, invite uh, Philip just to say a little bit more about uh, about the acquisitions committee uh, and this uh, peer review document, um, which, as I say, is sort of the, the the stepping point for today's conversation. Though it needn't be always focus on. Um, and then uh, I'll say a few remarks to frame um, the comments uh, by uh, our guests, and then we will turn to them. That will probably take you know 30 minutes or so, and then we will open it up and take uh, questions. So we just encourage uh, participation from all of you out there. Uh, and uh, so, Philip, why don't you get us started? Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah. I mean, as many of us know, um, one of the distinct features, if not the most important sort of distinguishing feature of university press publishing, is the peer review. Um, but in fact, there wasn't really a document out there publicly available that explained the rationale or detailed the process for peer review and the factors that a press or an editor need to consider when they're conducting peer review. So in 2014, the AAUP asked um, this newly formed acquisitions committee to come up with a best practices guide that would explain the intellectual and philosophical uh, underpinnings of peer review um, and the role that it plays um, in the decision making process for a university press, as well as providing some practical advice for editors when they're um, conducting peer review. Um, so the, the document is very much for um, editors and for presses, but we also wanted it to be something that could be um, used to articulate and to explain to the outside world what it is that university presses are doing and how they think about peer review process. So it was important to us that university administrators, for instance, um, see it, librarians see it, um, scholars and authors, um, as well as sort of new um, scholarly publishing ventures that are starting to emerge from libraries and other places that might be interested in joining the AAUP or seeing how university presses conduct peer review. 
Um, the way we assembled the document is we really much drew on the experience of the different editors on the committee. Um, they include about, I think it's about eight or nine editors um, with different levels of experience and we all you know, work in different areas in the humanities, social sciences, and sciences. And we represent presses um, of varying sizes um, and coming from different institutions, so both state-run places, um, private universities, and then larger presses like the University of Chicago Press, and then relatively smaller presses like Georgia um, or the University of Iowa Press. Um, you know, I think for the most part, we were able to settle on a consensus um, fairly quickly and that we all sort of do peer review process in similar ways. Um, there were some discrepancies and we sort of wanted to address that and bring that out um, in the um, document. Um, you know, these would be things like at what point is it sent out for peer review? Um, how do you handle trade books? And there, again, there's some discrepancies and we wanted to sort of reflect the different practices that are out there. Um, as Peter quotes um, in the, from the document, you know, the peer review process is highly complex, involves many individuals and must be responsive to the norms of the appropriate fields. So those kinds of variations were very much taken into consideration. Um, once we kind of worked through the different drafts and through a lot of conversations, we also showed it to peers um, at other presses um, who were not involved in the, in the process, just to sort of get as full a sense of what was out there. Um, so what exactly is in the document? Um, well, of course, you can see that online, so I'm not going to sort of uh, rehash exactly um, what's in it. But the way it's structured is to, um, it begins by opening up, by explaining the importance of peer review for advancing scholarship and for um, providing sort of a basis for um, acquisitions editors and presses to decide what to publish. Um, and then it kind of focuses more on practical concerns and it's structured in a way that reflects the order of the process of peer review um, and is organized also around a series of questions um, that we have to think about. Um, and again, the focus on how editors work with their reviewers, how those um, reports and peer reviews are um, transmitted and explained to authors, um, and then also to faculty boards as well. Um, so, you know, some of the questions we might have looked at is, you know, do different types of books require different types of peer reviews? Do we have the same kind of peer review process for a textbook that we would for a trade book that we would for a scholarly monograph? Likewise, do different disciplines have different standards? Um, and we did find that there is some, um, different ways that, um, let's say, a science editor will handle peer review as opposed to someone in the humanities. Um, we also looked at selecting peer reviewers. Um, who's qualified um, to be a peer reviewer? Um, where do we find peer reviewers and how do we sort of make sure that um, we're getting the right people um, for a particular project? Um, and what kind of structure or guidelines do we give for reviewers? What are some of the issues that they should be looking at when they're peer reviewing something? Um, and then once we get the peer reviews back, how do we work with an author? Um, how much help should we give them in responding to the peer reviews um, when they're responding for our faculty boards and for our colleagues as well? Um, and then, you know, questions like, what do we do when we have one very strong report and one negative report? Do we send it out again? Um, what is the process there? And then finally, um, looking at these peer reviews as documents of records um, and considerations like the uh, anonymity of peer reviewers, should that be protected? Um, as well as, you know, how do these um, reports maybe factor in or should they factor into tenure considerations for our authors as well? Um, so, you know, we saw this as kind of a very good sort of state of where we are now. These are some practices that are commonly accepted. These are practices that seem to work very well for a lot of university presses um, and allow us to publish um, what we do in a thoughtful and responsible way. Um, but we also recognize that it's not the final word, um, that this is something that's open to discussion. And as new forms of scholarly communication develop, um, as the publishing environment might change, you know, it's healthy to, to look back at this again and sort of see are there things that we can be doing differently. And then, you know, in particular, and this is something we didn't address um, too carefully because, again, it, it's, it's sort of a, a moving field. You know, how are things like digital-born products, um, projects, rather, 
going to be assessed? Do we have to apply the same kinds of criteria that we did for books or do we need some new ways to think about it and to, you know, perhaps go out to different people as well um, to, uh, to review those projects? So again, I think in the, you know, in the coming years, we kind of look forward to this um, document as, you know, perhaps evolving and getting feedback, um, not only from our colleagues, but I think also the outside world, because again, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, we very much want this to be a way to um, have a variety of different communities who we work with to understand what we do and what we prioritize. Great. Great. Thanks, Bill. So that's uh, good feedback. Um, that does a great job of uh, Give me an account of what uh, we're up to in the document and uh, raising some of the questions that I think uh, we'll talk about today. So I'll just uh, briefly say uh, a couple things and uh, we'll turn it over to our guests. So um, <clears throat> just to frame the discussion today, so um, uh, picking up on what Philip was saying about uh, about the, doc the handbook, um, uh, it, I, I, the one way I put it is that it captures uh, uh, a pretty conservative uh, 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 picture of peer review uh, in the sense that it's not the document was not meant to uh, paint uh, a, a picture of what the future of peer review uh, will look like and uh, it was not meant to be sort of cutting edge so it was meant to be sort of a distillation of what you know this committee with lots of input thought uh, was um, uh, a rigorous uh, well-functioning uh, process of peer review um, so that raises so given that that raises sort of uh, um, the question, uh, well, how well does the report succeed on its own terms? I mean, is this, uh, is this a, a full and, and accurate report uh, of how peer review works? And I think uh, one wrinkle there is it's, it's, uh, it's a kind of idealized version. So when we look at the actual world and the way that uh, uh, peer review works, uh, there may be things that uh, are, you, know, you know we didn't discuss in the document that are worth keeping in mind and thinking carefully about when thinking about peer review, and I know that uh, I've invited uh, our, uh, our panelists today to, to talk about that. And then the second thing is, um, said the, the, the issue of you know how well it captures the current scene. Uh, what what does the future of peer review look like uh, um, in light of some of the things that Philip raises, the the, the changing nature of, of scholarly output. Um, so um, I'm now going to turn it over uh, to uh, to our panelists to to uh, give us their thoughts about, about those two ideas and, and whatever else they want to offer. So first, uh, Sarah Bond. Sure, thanks, Matt, and, and thanks to, to everyone at the AAUP that invited us here. I just wanted to say that I think that the uh, manual is a really great guide to see the current state of peer review and the expectation. Uh, and that's why I gave it to my graduate students to, to look to see how their work will likely one day be evaluated. Um, so uh, I think that, that it, it was a great state of the field and a, and a great prep for understanding how the process works. And at least uh, in my feeling, I think that there are some things that oftentimes we don't want to talk about um, or that we don't know about that I want to talk a little bit about today. Um, so the first thing is the issue of gender and diversity within uh, peer review. Um, and I'll be talking about digital humanities assessment in, in just a second. But first let me start with the issue of, of women in, in diversity in particular, uh, which is to say that we all wish that this bias did not exist. We all wish that, that we could read a, a piece of work um, and that anytime we saw certain pronouns or we could guess at the work of somebody, that we weren't somehow influenced by the gender of that person. Um, and blind peer review certainly does um, uh, work towards uh, having uh, the gender of the person be a non-issue. Um, and, and, that's, and, and that's a wonderful first step. But um, a lot of times, particularly in my field, which is classics, it's a very small world after all. Uh, and we have to realize that a lot of people know each other and will be able to recognize the work of other people. Um, and as we've seen from a lot of sociological studies, particularly from NC State in the past uh, year or two years, uh, students and reviewers are influenced by whether they know the gender of the person. Um, they tend to think that male instructors are very austere and, and very have a lot of dignity and are to be trusted. And women are oftentimes seen as shrill and 
skinny, but sometimes a little bit bitchy. Um, and so these perceptions can also come into the section of peer review um, and need to be uh, accounted for, for sure, when when a uh, blind peer review is going out, but also in the assignment of peer reviewers. Um, mm -hmm. So it can oftentimes be very difficult um, to get an even panel of both men and women to review an article or a manuscript. Um, particularly in the field of ancient history, which is my subfield, there's about seven men for every one woman in ancient history. Wow. Just to give you an idea, at the University of Cincinnati, the application for their ancient history position was about 11 women and 118 men. Wow. Okay, so it's very difficult to get women, uh, and particularly we have a heavy load on our shoulders to do the reviews, right? If we're like the only person that people are coming to. Yet, at the same time, it's very important to try and get some sort of gender representation or gender balance when you are trying uh, to put together um, a, a panel of reviewers for whatever you're doing. Um, so, so that it's not just older men that are assessing. And in, in tandem with that, uh, it is also very difficult in classics, at least, to get people of color um, that are also going to be assessing work. But it, I think, is very important to think about when you are thinking about who your reviewers are going to be for a manuscript or for an article. Um, and and so uh, these are all just things that need to be taken into account, even if we wish and hope that that it's something that we would never um, uh, actually uh, commit to, to do some kind of gender bias or to be racist. Uh, but we can't control um, what the people we're sending it out to really uh, are, are going to be doing, except for by selecting the best people possible and having a representative panel. Um, so that's kind of the, the first issue that I wanted to talk about, and I'll switch now to, to just say a little bit about the future of peer review in the digital humanities, which is something that I work a lot with. Um, I'm going to try and screen share now, uh, so I'll show you a little bit. But um, I, I complained a lot at the SCS, which is the Society for Classical Studies, last year about all-male panels. It's something that was very bothersome to me, and I continue to uh, speak a lot about. Uh, but instead of just complaining about it, I came back to the digital publishing, uh, digital scholarship and publishing studio here at the University of Iowa, um, which is headed uh, by a great group of people. And we started to put together a database of women in ancient history, as well as the map, so that publishers uh, and people who were just looking for reviewers in general could go to the map um, and actually find women. Kind of the idea of having a binder full of women online uh, that you can consult uh, and see. So we'll try and share that here. Okay. Okay. So uh, let me just give you a quick run through here. Here is my name, Sarah E. Bond. And you can see the fields that I do, and you can also hopefully in the future see my rank uh, so that you know that you can send me certain articles or if I have tenure, et cetera, et cetera. You can see the different people that say work in epigraphy, or maybe you love Mary Beard and you want to see if Mary Beard can do something so you can locate her. Uh, just, you know, trying to tell you, Mary Beard has a lot on her plate, so probably go, <laughs> probably, probably not. But uh, the idea is to have uh, women at the ready so that the next time somebody tells me they cannot find a woman uh, in order to, uh, they can't find a woman in order to serve on a panel, um, that we can actually give them alternatives. We can use our database construction, we can use mapping, and we can use network analysis through Gephi in order to say, I'm sorry, that's BS. There are women that can do this. There's no reason to have an all-male panel, and there's no reason to have an all-male panel for reviews of books or articles. Um, and so our hope is that in the future this happens for women, but also uh, that we will be able to do it for digital humanities projects in general. Um, the, the last thing I'll say is that I know I need to, to hand it over. That's, fine. Is just, um, That's very impressive, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Well, it, it was very much a collaboration between myself and, and uh, Friends of Digital Humanities and Tom Keaton, who's the head of the studio here. But um, in, in any case, uh, it's, 
it's something that, that I think will be useful then for when we think about how to assess digital humanities projects in the future, because digital humanities is by nature collaborative. Um, that project I just showed you is not mine. It's actually the work of about five or six different people. So why should it be assessed by one other person that we send it to? The idea is then to have a list of digital humanities centers, like the Digital Scholarship and Publishing Studio here, or Tom Scheinfeld's uh, Digital Studio at the University of Connecticut, or perhaps the Digital Studio at Princeton, to have a list of these, and then treat these studios as entities that we send peer review to. So that you have 13 people that are GIS specialists, that are network analysis specialists, that all assess digital projects, and then can send a report probably along the guidelines of the AHA, which is the American Historical Association. These were guidelines that were set up by Seth Dindo, um, I think, uh, quite a few months ago. Um, to follow these assessment guidelines and to have peer review between digital studios for digital projects so that assistant professors and associate professors can add these to their tenure folders, but also so that digital librarians can use this peer review model and add it to their own CV um, as a publication. So um, I, I think that the future for, for women and also uh, for the issue of diversity and DH is just to think about how the model can best represent them, but also give them a chance to be heard and represented. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Sarah. That, uh, so we, I'm sure we will get back to, uh, to both of those issues. So, all right. Uh, next up, uh, Karen Wolf. Thanks. Um, well, first of all, tell me if it's really echoey and the sound is awkward and I'll put on a headset. Um, in a large, it's not beautiful bad. No, it's I want to thank Mount Vernon uh, and their gorgeous uh, presidential library here for letting me sneak off from a conference to this uh, to do this. I also want to thank uh, Matt and Phil for organizing this really interesting discussion. Um, I wasn't any part of uh, the process of creating this wonderful AAP best practices guide, um, but I was part of a scholarly kitchen um, conversation with Alison Muddit from the University of California Press um, and Mary Francis, who was deeply involved um, in the creation uh, of this best practices um, document in the University of Michigan and uh, it's it's really it's an extraordinary document I think as a historical artifact <laughs> one thing, right? um, because it, does, it does kind of capture this moment of trying to uh, in a lot of extraordinary range of changes in scholarly publishing and scholarly practices and it's trying to fix a moment for us um, and I think uh, in all kinds of ways it's interesting and useful. I want to express appreciation in particular for the fact that what it tries to do is underline um, some kind of core values um, and then to outline how current practices align with those values. What I think is important is, um, and I'm going to run through a couple of things here which I'll enumerate in just a minute, but I think what's important is thinking about how um, obviously different practices are going to evolve. Um, what I don't think will change much are these core values, actually. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit. But practices will likely change. And what will be helpful as that document kind of lives and breathes and evolves is uh, to respond and let practices respond um, to changing circumstances. So I wanted to just kind of address three things, and I'll be relatively brief because I think there's a lot of room for conversation here. I'm interested in Karen's um, contribution, too. Uh, one is just to talk about journals for a minute. Um, the second is to raise another issue around diversity. Um, and then the third, I think, is actually the most important part, which is um, how peer review plays a part in a much longer series of conversations in which scholars evaluate and respond to one another's work, and in which the primary purpose is really the production of excellent work. Um, so first, on journals, I think uh, the, the document is really about book production, and so it speaks best to book. Yeah. Its history is a field, so it's a, it's a helpful document because it's really dealing with acquisition editors looking for books, first of all, looking for authors, and then working with authors who have, who have sought them out, really, in a mutual process. Um, it doesn't so much deal with journals, um, and university presses are increasingly you know, doing journal production as more um, societies, for example, come under the um, under the wing really of, of university presses um, for cost and other purposes. So I think it would be useful for the the, uh, 
for the document to evolve to adapt to, to mm -hmm. general practices. And some of the some of the key ones there involve uh, things Sarah was talking about a little bit. Um, so let me switch now just to talk about uh, diversity and how that relates maybe to, to journal production. Actually, I think um, journals uh, tend to, at least in the humanities field, <laughs> uh, tend to seek a larger number of reviewers than uh, than book acquisition editors do. At our journal, um, our editors look for five reviewers for every piece, um, and so the opportunity. Uh, for diversity among those reviewers is actually pretty good in the sense that you've got five people who can get a reasonable diversity, but um, also in the same way that you don't want to produce Hasselhoff panels and you don't want, you know, this kind of um, Hasselhoff <laughs> uh, peer review uh, groups, um, you also don't want people who, uh, who come from a, one particular vantage point fields can be tremendously diverse. Even in my field of early American history, people are working across a whole variety of methodological um, uh, perspectives, working in different archives, working in different uh, specific regional approaches. And when you're looking at a specific piece of scholarship, you want people who come at it from different angles. Mm -hmm. So diversity of approach is important too. Mm -hmm. I want to put in a point for that. And then my last little point on diversity here is just that um, the document makes a reference to diversity of disciplines and diversity of fields. Well, I'm pretty sure that uh, four out of 10 things that I could say about the humanities would be right and or wrong for classics, for literature, for history, for whatever. Their disciplines have their own uh, kind of values, uh, values and cultures and practices that evolve over time. And some of them are deeply held and important. Some of them aren't so important, but whatever and even fields within those disciplines. So there really is diversity. And again, just to go back to the point about how the value in this document is really core values that need to be applied kind of flexibly and with judgment. So that's just a quick thing on journals and diversity. And the last point I wanna make um, is I think the most important to me anyway, is just the way that peer review um, is really uh, just one uh, part, and, and in many ways, not even the last part of a long process in which scholars share their work and engage with one another. Anyone who is submitting an article to our journal has already had probably the input of uh, people at conferences, maybe as many as four or five different conference presentations, seminars where people read the entire thing and respond to it. We've got a really dense seminar culture in my field, um, and often sharing work with colleagues you know, all of us have a handful of, you know, best buddies who read all of our work and respond to it. So by the time you get to peer review, um, that exchange, the critical exchange, has already happened in a number of venues. And I think it's really important for editors to understand and appreciate that point, that the work has been out there, has been circulating, has been in conversation already. It's also important for authors to appreciate that, too. Mm -hmm. The peer review is just a formalized version of a lot of what we've already been doing already. Um, so uh, much more to say, but those are my three Great. main points. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, get that, yeah, that last point is a, is a good one. Uh, um, and and um, yeah, not one I, I don't think that actually explicitly came up in the committee's conversation. So thank you for that. All right, so uh, finally, I'll invite uh, Lauren to, uh, to uh, give us some of her thoughts. Thanks so much. And I appreciate the invitation to participate in this and really also appreciate all the work that went into creating this document. Um, I wasn't involved on the committee, but I did. Uh, I was able to be a part of the collaborative lab at the AAUP, which was just a tremendous experience of um, a lot of acquisitions editors sitting together and uh, uh, you know working out some of these details and feeling like our perspectives were were being heard. And I did. I do. I think that the um, the published. Uh, pamphlet is incredibly useful in in a time where we actually are having a ton of turnover in acquisitions departments and a lot of mm -hmm. new folks coming up and so having a document that actually articulates a practice uh, and and you know to me it actually it it cleaves very closely to the three presses that I've been at so so the sensibilities even though I wasn't involved on the committee were are feel very uh, sound to the process of um, of what we do, and I appreciate the the documents I have to share with press, new press committee members, That's with great. new acquisitions editors, so that um, they can have a sense of of how to how to move forward with these things. Um, so I'm um, I think 
the fields that I work in are, are different than than some. So my uh, when Matt talked about um, peer review and the the document being sort of about an inherently conservative process and like with a small c, um, because the fields that I've been working in primarily are um, women's gender and sexuality studies and critical ethnic studies, peer review feels quite different from me than something that's quite conservative. Mm -hmm. So these fields have mm -hmm. both been around for 50 years at this point, which is not an insignificant amount of time, but for, um, uh, you know, other fields, they're they're fairly young. They're also incredibly dynamic and growing. And some of the conferences in these fields are, are doubling and tripling in size. And so um, to, for me in, in this process, I tend not to think, I, I appreciate all, everything as it's laid out in the document, but the, the generative and animating and transformative potential of peer review didn't come through um, mm -hmm. quite in the same way that I experienced it on a really day-to-day -day level. And to me, it's one of my my favorite things about the job is being witness to this um, process that's so incredibly moving, both like personally, professionally, and to fields. You know, and it's it's invisible to to many. You know, except for the people who are participating in it. So, um, so for the fields that I've worked in, given that, um, you know, they take up issues of diversity in really different ways than the more traditional fields that are male dominated and largely white, um, because these fields are comprised of primarily people of color and many women. So, um, so and, and the senior folks in these fields were, in some cases, the activists who were getting these fields institutionalized. So it, um, so who you turn to as peer reviewers, I mean, I always feel like I have people to turn to. I don't feel like I have a challenge finding enough women or people of color to review these manuscripts, but that's, you know, largely as a result of the institutionalizing work that they did. Um, still, what peer review does for those fields in, in a in presses and in institutions that are incredibly disciplinarily diverse is it, um, it, it, it allows forward movement that's recognized as a larger conversation that's underlined by integrity and by rigor in ways that it would be easy to dismiss some of the work partly because of um, systematic racism and sexism you could sort of you do dismiss whole fields but um and that happens uh but peer review allows for uh legibility of the work as scholarship and as you know forward movement in this way so so when i have a press committee there's you know on a press committee usually we try and align our press committee members so that they can evaluate our selection of appropriate peer reviewers which in these fields means people who are in those fields and subscribe to certain kind of principles of social justice generally and mm -hmm. um really you know have different challenges with the word diversity so um so it's it's a different process. So I think that um, what I also what I appreciated in the document too was the um, the no the sort of code for different expertise being out of the house. I think I mean being already out of the process and in house somehow because um, the selection of peer reviewers and the assessment of a manuscript's needs are to me like so much part of what we do um, at, in the craft of acquisitions and so and that's really finely tuned to disciplinary specificities so um, and that's something that you kind of need to actually talk to somebody who's on the ground either a scholar or a number of scholars or your supervisor or somebody who's worked in the list already so um, so those are so for me the um, the conservative peer review being conservative is 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 not actually what I experience in, in these fields I mean and I have worked across fields but um, uh, and you know methodologically there's issues and trying to get the right balance with interdisciplinary work is always a challenge, but to me it's always, it's a fairly dynamic uh, process. In terms of the um, new directions in peer review, um, it's uh, one of the things that I struggle with is how to take these values and apply them to projects that are indeterminate in ways that monographs and um, books aren't. Um, I think any kind of book can actually be approved, improved by peer review. So we review all of our trade books as well. And one, that's actually a selling point for some of our authors that their trade books will get this kind of developmental attention that's inherent in the peer review process. Um, that's not a selling point for all of them, but, but I've seen it review the books across the board. But for something where the audience is a little bit less clear, like for Digital Humanities Scholarship, we have a, a um, partnership that we're doing with UBC Press, which is about indigenous knowledge production and um, creating multi-path projects. And so thinking about like who are the 
readers and who are the people who are going to engage with these new new projects and how do we assess whether this fits a vision that's going to resonate for those yet to be determined audiences and also how do you assess something where um, any single person going through it might miss pieces of it so it's not you know miss pieces of it that you would actually want to make sure um, were sound and were on point um, but that might be uh, elided by one other one one of the paths that you take through the project so that was actually something that we had to work out a little bit um, in our in our melon grant application of, of how this um, peer review piece worked um, but I think that that's a challenge that I really am enthusiastic about uh, about um, thinking about so so um, those are my my brief thoughts I think there's you know I'm really excited to hear points of discussion all around so great thank you Lauren that's uh, I really it's interesting what you said about the the sort of animating and, and I think generative I think it's how you put it uh, nature of peer review uh, immediately was striking thank you for mentioning that because uh, I, I think that um, when I think of my own thinking about this, it's, it, I do tend to think of just the sort of evaluative aspect of it, right? Like, um, are we going to publish this or not? And, you know, if, please tell me what you think, whether, you know, peer reviewer, is that a good idea to do that? Um, but, but you're right, there is this whole other element of, of um, you know, uh, of ways to imp improve a work or, or, or ways to take it in a different direction. Um, um, so, that's a that's a wonderful comment. Um, so I thought uh, uh, I have lots of questions, uh, and there have been a couple of there's a couple of questions clearly sort of from um, editors uh, that have come through. I think I'll I'll wait a moment on those, um, but I wanted to sort of give any of you some opportunity to respond to some of the things you've heard. Um, uh, Matt, actually, I just have a quick question for for Sarah and Karen. I mean, how do you feel? Um, in terms of uh, university presses conveying to scholars about what they do? I mean, is that clear to scholars? Do university presses need to do a better job of explaining what the process is? Do you want to go? Uh, I think, oh, go ahead, Kim. No, 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 you go, you go first. Uh, I think that, that a lot of times uh, it would be nice to just have the manual accompanying it um, and to have a kind of a checklist sometimes because I know the last manuscript that, that I reviewed, there was really not a rubric or a guideline for me other than three or four questions that they asked me to answer. Ultimately being, would you, would you allow this manuscript to go forward? Right, what do right. you vote essentially to go forward? But I mean, just like when I grade papers, my students hate it when you just give them a, a grade without telling them why. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's really helpful really helpful to authors. I mean, I guess about, I guess three years ago, I had a, a really, an article that I worked very hard on, and um, and uh, I, I don't think he'll mind this, Andrew Rigsby at the University of Texas wrote me a five-page review of the article, and it was very intense, but I, I, it made it so much better, and I really appreciated it. Compare that to the other reader report I got for the same article, which was three sentences, right? <laughs> so a huge range of feedback that you're going to get from people, and everybody has different time constraints, right? And everybody has different processes of how they review. But I think if we want to give our authors um, the best kind of experience, then we have to say, please, in a page or more, tell us why X, Y, Z, and then have a rubric, because Getting that two or three sentences that just said, yeah, sure, publish it, <laughs> didn't make my article any better. It was not Even, generative, yes, right. No, right. no it, it didn't, and, and this is about that process that we just mentioned, that this is about a very long process of review from informal conversations with friends to conferences, then to this formalized process, and, uh, you know, there, there should be a quid pro quo here. I put a lot of time and energy into this. Don't give me two sentences. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think I, I think that that kind of was my response. Yeah. So, Karen, please, did you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah. I, I first of all, I loved what Laren uh, said about how um, the back and forth of peer review is the generative. It is the intellectual kind of oxygen in the in the process, and that's what makes it so 
rewarding, but I also think it's really important that we underscore that that is it, the purpose of scholarly publishing um, is to produce fine scholarship. And mm -hmm. so the point of peer review isn't just the up or down on yes or no. I mean, it is for the individual acquisitions editor, but in the macro sense, the, the goal is really to produce better scholarship. I mean, our goal, when our editors, whether in our book series or um, in our journal, their, their goal, because they, they reject 85% of what comes mm -hmm. in, but the goal should be that everything that comes in leaves better for the process. Mm -hmm. Um, and we try to make sure that we emphasize that it's the process that matters, not, I mean, yes, the outcome, and everybody would like to have the outcome being get published here, but everybody should get a really positive, um, and not everybody can feel that way, but, but everyone should know that the process itself is geared towards being productive and being, being generative. So that's one thing I wanted to mention is just that I think that's worth amplifying for editors, too, that they should that's feel... Good. But they're they're giving so much to an author by giving them their time um, and their expertise and you know in, in the current world where we are you know counting every little thing we ought to be counting too that this this really is um, additive it's really additive but the second thing is you Matt you asked specifically do scholars need to know more about um, about publishing and what what publishers are doing and I think that the absolute answer is yes. Mm -hmm. They do. I think many, um, you know, scholarly societies are, are seeing this. I'm doing a session at the American Historical Association with David Crotty at, from Oxford Journals and Rick Anderson um, on just kind of things that scholars need to understand about scholarly publishing. But I think they, they too often, um, when, it, when my graduate program is guilty of this too, when we do workshops for graduate students about publishing, it's really about how to get published. Um, so they look at you guys and they think, how can we get a publication out of you, <laughs> basically? Mm -hmm. We're not thinking about that larger system of this is part of the process of improving scholarship um, and part of the kind of iterative work of scholarly knowledge production. Great, thank you. So um, so I had a, a question that relates to something that, that um, has, has, has someone submitted as well that I will. So um, lot, lots of good discussion, as I thought there would be, about. Um, uh, diversity issues that arise with respect to peer review, um, and and I think as I think as most people know, for the most part, um, university press manuscripts are not double blind reviewed. Um, so they're anonymous. Um, you know, there's anonymity guaranteed to a reviewer. Um, uh, and then this question that has that was submitted: What do you you know? What do you how do you deal with cases in which reviewers want to reveal themselves or, or go behind your back and reveal themselves or are revealed, um, which we can discuss. But I am curious about what this, you know, because in journals, right, I mean, journals generally it's double blind. Um, but so, but there is a tension here if we want to, you know, if we want to be concerned about uh, about these diversity issues that, that uh, you have all raised here, uh, you know, it, do we need to rethink this, you know, single blind nature of I don't know it's a, it's a, it's a sensitive topic <laughs> so I throw it out there but touch it if you want to yeah in in my in the in the reviews that I got back from my manuscript uh, I could tell that the person had googled me because they kept calling me a young scholar um, and uh. I, I don't know how they would know that unless they looked me up um, and it was it was really condescending I was uh, even if it was positive overall and they sent it forward to be called, uh, this is her first book, she is a young scholar. Uh, that was not information that was given to them. Mm -mm. Uh, so so I, I would actually appreciate a movement more towards double blind in manuscript review rather than just in journal. Yeah. Yeah. So so Lauren, what do you think about that? I mean, you know, so from the point of view of a of an editor but who also, you know, Thinks a lot about these issues of diversity and in, in the fields that you work in and in your. Do you want? Do you want to? Do you want to say anything about that? I mean, I the the some of the challenges I would see in double blind submission are really pragmatic, um, mm -hmm. and it's just that um, we struggle to get folks who are really overcommitted to turn their attention to do sustained you know, focused critique, which takes some time. So, um, so even when, so without knowing who that person was, I think it would be challenging, more challenging to, um, to get reviewers to agree to, to do it. That's so, and it's not, 
I don't, I don't have the same, I do, um, given the fields that I work in, I, I mean, I have seen some young scholar kinds of comments. Um, I think that things that are, are where, where things feel condescending, it's very difficult. And so it's, it's, you know, it's not, it's not what you want to see from a reviewer and it's tone issues to control for, but it's not that common as far as I can tell. Um, and I mean, it's, it's, I don't mean to dismiss that particular um, challenge. It's just, I, I can't see how single blind, I mean, double blind would work with manuscript reviewing given the challenges we find. So unless we paid more or unless we could give people more time or something, but all of those things are, are challenging, so. Okay. So Phil, so, if I, yeah, if you want to, and, and maybe you want to add, add, yeah, sure, speak ahead. for my, myself more and rather than, you know, the committee or, yeah, or Columbia Press necessarily. But, you know, I mean, it is both the peer review process, as we've talked about, you know, to produce better scholarship is a, is, you know, the crucial and probably the most important thing, but it is kind of also a publishing decision that the press right. needs to make. And I think, you know, we also want to get a sense from the reviewers, you know, what's your sense of this author as a scholar? What's their position in the field? Because, you know, we want to publish authors who, you know, have a stake in their field and are known in their field and are seen as people who, you know, want to contribute to that field. So, you know, so they're not, um, they're going to be authors who will have, and their work will have a, have a long life and a, make a contribution to the field. Okay, good. Um, Can I just say all right, and so, yeah, please go ahead, Karen. I just wanted to add one. Um, this is really a tiny, it might be perceived as a tiny thing, but I think it's actually important. Um, one thing that this document doesn't do is give people who are running small, really small journals um, some kind of super practical advice. So you guys, mm -hmm. this is funny, but this was raised on Twitter actually in a discussion about peer review during peer review week, which is that mm -hmm. for many smaller journals that are being run by faculty, you know, out of their offices and so on, um, people aren't aware of some basic things you need to do to ensure double blind review, like strip the properties on yep. manuscripts mm -hmm. that are going out and just, you know, you're saving a PDF, you can't, like, anyway, those are actually quite crucial, those small details. And, you know, in the kind of how to manual, I think that stuff actually has to be addressed because not everybody's equipped to, to deal with that. But yeah, no, that's a good point. I thought stuff. of the same thing, yeah, when I was looking at it this morning you know we talk around those kinds of things but we we don't quite get to that level so that's, yeah that's no it's quite it's, I, I i just saw a kind of horror story um anyway oh we all we all have them i'm sure yeah yeah <laughs> um, okay so uh and again i'm i'm, I'm gonna for the, thank you for those who submitted questions and i'm gonna turn to those in a minute but uh uh, and this may, this may be a rather big topic to say we'll only talk about for a minute but no one has mentioned open peer review <laughs> um <laughs> Which, uh, yeah, so which I was surprised about because I, I uh, you know, in terms of thinking about alternative uh, ways of doing peer review or the future peer review, you know, that, that is this kind of standard um, can, can alternative say, model. So please, yeah, you know, if anyone wants to say anything, can I, I, inv can I, I invite just, you. Well, yes, Karen. I think, so um, I think there, there, are some, there are a variety of people who have proposed interesting ideas around open peer review. Um, I know Kathleen Fitzpatrick has done some very interesting stuff with this in her first book, and I actually did a pretty close analysis of what happened with planned obsolescence and the, um, the, the open review um, work on that. But I mean, for my discipline in my field, open review is the seminar process. That's, oh, that's good. what mm -hmm. we do. It's, it's another version of open review, but I think sometimes we mistake open review as replacing the formal process for, um, for publication when really, I mean, we have other ways of doing that. Um, that are really productive and, and important. Right. That's and I, I would just say that, that anonymity, I think, is still really important. Yeah. I think it's important for people to be able to say the things that they're thinking um, and to contribute. So even if I've ever been hurt by things said, um, that's nothing compared to the overall benefit of the fact that they have said something that they genuinely feel. I mean, I feel as though they're being petty in some cases, but I think overall, the blind review process protects anonymity and allows them to say things they wouldn't normally say in open peer review. Yeah. And I can see this, you know, just when I run blind discussion sections with my students. Yeah. They get much more open to say things that they feel about the class, about me, about the readings that we've done yeah. than they ever do in discussion section when I'm looking at them. Um, and, and so, but I, I see a lot of value still in anonymity. Okay, good. All right, so I'm going to turn to a couple of the, oh.
someone was interjecting. Too. Oh, I was just going to yeah, please, briefly go mention that um, open peer the 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 difference the self selecting nature of open peer review. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it gives it gives me pause when we have uh, you know the expertise to ask people for specific expert for specific perspectives and apply those perspectives to a project and evaluate it in that way. And so um, I appreciate many many forms of peer review. A lot of our authors turn to their communities. Who wait, I mean the in Native and Indigenous studies, many send their books uh, to their tribal communities, which is really important and which we want to see and we want to hear articulated. And folks, um, there have been uh, selection processes for these wonderful first books seminars at, at, at institutions where um, authors get to choose their people who are coming in and giving them feedback on their work and um, but those to me when when a manuscript has peer review coming from multiple directions it's just such an incredibly rich set of feedback for the author to grapple with that all actually does something slightly different yeah. That's good. Yeah, that's great. I think this is interesting. This is, this is a very, um, you've all touched on this idea that, uh, that, that peer review goes beyond the press, um, uh, which, is, which is a really wonderful point. And, and, and I think not something that those of us in presses always remember. So uh, in a sense, it's actually kind of a relief, right? I mean, it's the burden's not all on us, but uh, that's a good point. Okay, so a, a few questions have come in, um, uh, most of which are sort of directed for editors. Um, but I invite everyone to. So the, one question is, a, is an interesting one because we definitely, I remember talking about this and we do discuss this in the document, it has to do with what's the best practice for, um, you know, creative projects or, or regional projects, uh, you know, th that are not standard academic monographs. It could be poetry and fiction uh, or, you know, it could be, again, book, uh, books about, you know, trade, uh, what, uh, books about local or local audiences. Um, uh, so Philip, why don't you, do you want to at least briefly say what the document has to say about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually trying to remember now. I do remember a lot of discussion about it, and I should say, you know, at Columbia, oh, me, sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, like Washington, you know, we actually everything does have to be sent out for peer review on, on some level, and I think we kind of left it a little bit open, if I remember correctly, but just because there is a fair amount of. Um, variety in the way different presses handle it. Um, I think for the most part there is some sort of other um, body or individual that's weighing in on it, whether it's a series editor or someone on the faculty board. Um, but it does require a lot of sort of reliance on you know the expertise of the editor and what they sort of feel um, is the best way to go and the responsibility. Um, you know, the you know does it sort of fulfill the mission of the university press um, and its uh, hosting institution. So um, I, th I think yeah. there are kind of a variety of different ways that, that a press can approach right. that. Right. Yeah. So my, right, my, my recollection similarly was that I think we suggested as a best practice that everything, everything does get peer reviewed, uh, but, but, that the, but that there is a wide variety of what that, who those reviewers would be depending on the nature you know, and what that review consists of. Um, yeah. But our suggestion was that everything would be, you know, would there be some cons consultation going on um, yeah. beyond just the editor or something like that. So, yeah. Um, that and the other time that this sometimes comes up is with very competitive projects, particularly if the university press is going against the trade press and they sort of have to make a, a decision sooner rather than later. Um, but, you know, in those cases, if if it's a scholarly monograph or it has a scholarly component, it might be put under contract without peer review, but when the final manuscript comes in, it will, that part of it will be peer reviewed. Right, okay, good. All right, uh, so uh, uh, this question says, um, it says something that Lauren talked about, but I think this is something that Karen talked about, but about uh, in, the, in the world of journal review, assessing an article and assessing the journal's needs. And the question is, uh, the request is, can you say more about that? How to communicate to reviewers, and this actually applies to books too, how to communicate to reviewers um, that, yes, we're asking you to sort of look at this, but uh, here are some needs that the that we have or what we're looking for. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah. This is the, the request. Do you have any thoughts on how to communicate that to reviewers? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, can, I can speak about this in terms of um, very, very particularly. So the journal that, that my institute publishes, the William & Mary Quarterly, um, is 
the field of early American history, which is a really big field. It's four centuries, four continents. It's huge. And so the work that's published in the journal, as I said, we accept you know very very little, about twelve percent, maybe, maybe not even. Some years it's about eight percent of what comes in. Um, but it, everything that is published has to speak to that broad field. So it has to be both excellent in the primary research and make a specific contribution in the primary research, but it also has to speak to really broad methodological, even theoretical um, issues that the field as a whole is grappling with, which means that if a project is, is somewhat more narrow, the editor may say, you know, I think you're, this is good, but I think your work may fit better in this kind of journal or that kind mm. of journal. And yeah. usually twice, um, I mean, our, our editors aim to give uh, authors a roadmap through the reader's reports, but also to give a clear sense of why they're responding to the work themselves the way they are. And they will say, have you thought about this journal, this journal, this journal? They try never to walk away without saying, you know, here's the reasons why we don't think it's a good fit for our journal, but here are some others mm -hmm. which might be more, might be more appropriate. So. Yeah, that's great. It, it's interesting. This uh, um, it does come up, I think, somewhat in the document, but it's certainly something we discussed a lot. This idea of fit. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I talk to potential authors, or you know, if I get invited to speak at a seminar or something, I emphasize this that you know, this is this may be something that a lot of scholars don't know about. This idea that fit is is a major part of publishing decisions. Yeah. Um, it's important. Uh, you think about the fellow travelers for the scholarship. In a book yeah. Scene. You want your fellow travelers to have a kind of coherence. Yeah. Right. Very good. Um, okay. We have a few minutes left, so I'll just mention again. This is a little bit. This is mostly directed to, to the editors here. Uh, but um, so th there was a question about uh, the faculty review boards. Again, something that sort of loomed over the discussion uh, among the committee members. But um, and the question was, you know, should faculty uh, review boards serve as a, as um, as another level of peer review? Um, you know, or should they their role be limited to sort of evaluating reports as they are presented? Um, Lauren, do do you have do you want to as one of the editors here? You want to take a stab at what you think about that? Um, I've I've worked at presses where boards have functioned quite differently at, at different yeah. places. So um, in terms of the, I, I mean, my inclination is to, that they shouldn't serve as a third peer reviewer mm -hmm. in that kind of formalized sense. But uh, the caveat is that the faculty committee needs to fully trust the editor's judgments about selecting the peer reviews and um, it, it, the peer reviewers and going through the process. So that may mean a fair amount of um, sustained conversation with the faculty board members, with the editors and the editors in the specific field. So um, so I, I think, no, they shouldn't serve as a third peer reviewer, but at the same time, if they're completely um, at the end of the process and have no ability to um, com comments on, on what they see as the integrity of the process for their field, then that's also going to be a problem. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with, with Lauren. I think that's a good way of, of putting it. And yeah, it's always best to just get that third reviewer. I think one of the things that the faculty board can be very good at is sometimes reading between the lines of a report. You know, you might get a, a negative report and there, the faculty board member might know something about the scholarly discussion or the nature of the reviewer's work that you might not know not being a scholar in that field and they can help illuminate that and that can help you um, with the decision making process. Right, right, thank you. Yeah, so that, and, and we should wrap up here, but yeah, that in, in terms of thinking about things that scholars don't know, I do wonder what scholars know or what we should be doing to let them know about the role that faculty boards play or, you know, and it, the interesting thing is it, it clearly emerged from the committee that there, it's a ton of diversity actually out there about the role they play. So, um, and I, it, it, it's possible that the committee may weigh, weigh in on that uh, at some point. There, there is conversation going on right now, so uh, people can keep their eyes out for that. Well, anyway, uh, it, uh, it looks like our time is up. Uh, so, thank you, uh, Sarah, Karen, and Lauren, and uh, Phil for being here. Uh, this was a really wonderful discussion, uh, and um, surely one that we could have for much longer and, and lots to think about. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Okay. Thank All you right. so much. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.